Welcome to the first lecture on the history of contemporary literature. In this first lecture, I'd like to discuss a few general aspects of contemporary literature. In which conditions have contemporary works of literature been produced? In which ways have contemporary works of literature evolved? That's what we're going to find out. As in previous classes, I'd like to begin by making a general observation about art movements. As mentioned, the next two lectures will focus on two particular movements, existentialism and postmodernism. Now these labels, these isms, are categories that we in the present project onto our object of study, which existed in the past. By imposing such abstract concepts, we try to make some sense of the mess that artists and writers have unthinkingly left behind. As such, however, these concepts and categories are not cast into stone. Even more, works that show characteristics of one movement can often be put under a different heading as well. This kind of cross-fertilizing often yields fascinating and provocative insights. Now, this general remark must be qualified a bit for the purposes of the present period. It is significant that it is in this period, the period after the Second World War, that many of these movements of the past, or isms, are identified and listed. The post-war period is marked by an explosion of cultural criticism and scholarly research. This is not to say that the history of literature was not studied in the past. Even in antiquity, we find scholars such as Aristotle discussing the essentials of tragedy. What might be the difference? What separates an ancient critic such as Aristotle from a contemporary critic such as Edward Said, who argued that the representations of the Orient in Western literature served as implicit justifications for the colonial and imperial ambitions of the European powers? There are many points of difference, but I'd like to stress the evaluative tone of many earlier approaches. What concerned scholars from Aristotle to, say, T.S. Eliot, was how to determine which poems were the best and why. After the massacres of the Second World War, such an approach began to seem vacuous and pedantic, and indeed it turned out that it often functions as a disguise for nationalist ideologies. After the Second World War, scholars took a different approach and began to develop models that were not evaluative in tone, but more descriptive. The linchpin in this development is often taken to be Erich Auerbach. In his Mimesis, The Representation of Reality in Western Literature, Auerbach compares the ways in which writers depicted everyday life from Homer to Virginia Woolf. Auerbach's aim was not to show that one writer or one tradition was better or more successful. Instead, he provided an overarching perspective that allowed him to highlight recurring patterns and ideas. Many scholars followed in his footsteps and began to develop their own theories of culture. At this point, you might begin to wonder, why is this important for our understanding of literature? Importantly, these new theories of culture fed back into cultural practice. In other words, the development of new theories of culture led to the development of new ways of writing. Take, for instance, Simone de Beauvoir's Le Deuxième Sex, The Second Sex, which was published in 1949. In this book, de Beauvoir dissects how throughout history male writers have consistently defined women as relative to men. In other words, the male writer generally does not define a woman as herself, but as other than himself. He takes himself as the point of reference, rather than the female other. De Beauvoir writes, for instance, how feminine devotion is demanded as a duty by Montorlan and Lawrence. Less arrogant, Claudel, Breton and Stendhal admire it as a generous choice. Not exactly a lofty notion, as I'm sure you will agree. And at this point, de Beauvoir is still being nice. As a result, de Beauvoir's ideas inspired a wave of feminist fiction, such as that of Margaret Atwood, who was reading de Beauvoir in the early 60s, well before she published The Handmaid's Tale. Vice versa, the development of new ways of writing led to the development of new theories of culture, as we will see in the next lecture, when we will turn to existentialism. In short, Contemporary literature is characterized by a close imbrication of theory with practice. The development of the study of culture also influenced contemporary literature in another way. More than in previous eras, contemporary literature is obsessed by the past. Authors' faith in the originality of the idea their ideas begins to dwindle as they realize that writing is a process over which they have only partial control. What they may be writing, they realize, 
may have been written already. This is especially important for the development of postmodern literature, as we will see. In postmodern literature, literature is seen as a dense network of citations and phrases, an endless repetition of words whose origin has been obscured by the mists of time. But the awareness that the past resurfaces as one is writing is also manifest in a very different form of literature, that is, in lowbrow forms, pulp fiction such as the romance novel or the crime novel. Being produced en masse, such novels make no claim to originality, but gladly use narratives and themes that are widely accessible and shared. What conclusion can we draw from the fact that both a supposedly highbrow movement, such as postmodernism, and a supposedly lowbrow movement, such as the romance novel, revolve around a concern with previously written works? It no longer makes sense to make this kind of distinction. There is no longer a clear-cut distinction between a high style and a low style, between an elevated subject and a vulgar subject. There are many examples that one could give. An ostensibly popular crime novel such as Raymond Chandler's The Long Goodbye in fact contains challenging social criticism. If you don't know the novel, you might have seen The Big Lebowski, which is just as hilarious. Indeed, whenever you encounter a clueless detective who inadvertently stumbles on the truth, you are witnessing the afterlife of Chandler's novel. Conversely, a philosophical re reflection on the notion of the self, such as Paul Auster's City of Glass, may make use of the conventions and clichés of the detective novel. Perhaps there are other novels that you can think of. In the handbook, Helke van den Braber and Matthijs Sanders discuss the fate and fortune of D. H. Lawrence's Lady Chatterley's Lover. In this novel by a serious author, they point out, Lawrence relies heavily on what seemed like pornographic language, thus blurring the age-old boundary between pornography and proper literature. The covers that you can see here do create certain expectations, but I'll leave it up to you whether or not the novel lives up to these. In the chapter by Van den Braber and Sanders, you've also read more about the ways in which literature was commodified and institutionalized in the period after the war. The use of illustrations on the cover here is just one element. Perhaps you can think of a few ways in which novels are marketed, or have been marketed, in the recent past. Think, for instance, of the ways in which publishers and libraries group certain works into certain categories. The ways in which translations further the dissemination of a book, or the ways in which authors influence the reception of their work by appealing to their personal contacts. In addition to the illustrations and examples that uh, are given in the handbook, perhaps there are other examples that you can think of, examples that are perhaps closer to the present. Think, for instance, of the ways in which authors now have to market themselves. Chances are that some of your favorite authors are not just writers, but also musicians, or painters, or vloggers. Or consider the fact that there are so many online platforms where beginning writers can share their work, or indeed collaborate on a work. What about the stories told in video games, which were created by teams of writers often working in different parts of the globe? What about wealthy patrons and their motivations? Take the case of the graphic novel Dispossession. As some of you may know, I was involved in the creation of this work, which is an adaptation of a Victorian novel by Anthony Trollope. This work, this adaptation, was made possible through the legacy of a Flemish priest, who expressed the hope that his earthly belongings would be put in the service of the public appreciation and scholarly investigation of the works of Anthony Trollope. This kind of disinterested endeavour is rare, however. Most patrons seek to acquire some kind of social standing, some kind of symbolic capital, by funding artistic projects. Even a funding program that seems to be disinterested, such as UNESCO's Cities of Literature, may be double-edged. As Sara Bruyette has shown, literary tourism and festival programming can be quite lucrative for some people, but is also, under a different light, a story of decline. And I'm, of course, not just referring to the fact that Nijmegen missed out on Utrecht in securing this particular honour. Of particular interest here, is another development in the area of education. These days, if you want to become a writer, what do you do? Or rather, where do you go? You don't have to teach yourself or to read widely and wildly. 
You can also go to the university and take a course in creative writing. These courses tend to focus on the technical aspects on the craft of writing, and they pay less attention to the aesthetic and historical aspects of literature. The reality is more complex than I now make it seem, but it is important to note that the idea of writing fiction as something that could be taught outside of any sustained literary tradition was something unheard of in the first half of the 20th century. The rise of departments of creative writing began in the United States because of the emergence of mass higher education after the war and has left an indelible imprint on American literature. Slowly but steadily, other literary traditions have been influenced by the de this development as well. At our university, for instance, we regularly collaborate with students who are studying creative writing at Otess University of the Arts in Arnhem. This brief overview of the conditions within which contemporary literature has developed only skims the surface, but I hope that I've made clear how the past 70 years have been marked by a new and productive symbiosis between the study of literature and the creation of literature. I hope that it is clear how the study of literature after the Second World War differs from earlier approaches, how theoretical concerns have shaped literature and literary works have shaped theories of culture, how as a result of this imbrication, the dynamic between high culture and low culture has become fluid. And finally, how the development of a mass market and a system of mass education have changed the dynamics of the literary field. If there are any questions about these issues, please do let me know in the discussion forum.